this next song is a little bit um, influenced by my mom. She had a habit to say, Martin, don't let ever anybody tell you what you cannot do. Because nobody knows you better than you do. And as I found out late in life, moms are always right. Thank you. You're right. You're absolutely welcome. Right. So a little bit of nobody knows me better. Martin Gershwitz. I'm a keyboard player, violin player, singer. Um, I started all this when I was very young. I was born um, in a family with six kids. My dad was a church organ player. My mom had flute students, about 200 at a time, all together over the years, probably 10,000. Um, and we were all, when we were like five years old, everybody had to play the, the flute, the upright flute. It was mandatory, literally. And we were six years old, everybody had to play the piano. Again, mandatory. And when we were like nine years old, we had to play a string instrument. In my case, it was the violin. In my sister's case, the viola. In my brother's case, the cello. Anyway, so by the time we grew up, 
or during the time we grew up, we, each one of us played three instruments, but strictly classical stuff. And since my dad was a church organ player, I ended up, I was the guy who showed probably the most interest at piano. Uh, he took me to the church and uh, showed me how to play the church organ um, at an age of like seven or eight. And uh, for example, I played the uh, Johann Sebastian Bach Toccata and Fugue. I mean, as good as a six-year-old or eight-year-old can play it, you know. We had like every Sunday afternoon from two to four, we gathered all the family and had a house concert. And uh, this, this became like a habit or for argument's sake, we, uh, we, uh, we did this on a regular basis. And it was nice. I have to say I learned a lot um, playing with other musicians, though they were my siblings. And every now and then, everybody knows this about siblings, there may be some you just had a, some kind of a fight and then you don't really want to play with them or play differently, but altogether it was a great time we had. At one point, my older brother, the cello player, who actually already was on the way to become a very, very good and successful cello player, uh, turned me on to a totally different music. I was 16 years old in 1968 um, and he gave me Keith Emerson's first band, The Nice, one of these albums for as a Christmas present. And uh, I just listened to it and I was hooked immediately. I thought, no, this is the kind of stuff I want to do. Uh, I love classical music, but I like this, because Keith Emerson those days, he uh, did pop classic, not necessarily a rock classic, pop classic. He, uh, he uh, you know, did pop rock versions of Johann Sebastian Bach tunes. One in particular, the Brandenburger, was called the Brandenburger and it was uh, from the Brandenburg Concerto number six from Johann Sebastian Bach, a kind of a rock pop version. And that sold me and that, that's how I started my life as it turned out. Immediately, as a, as a result of what my older brother did, um, I got together with a few classmates and we formed a band. And, but they actually, they already kind of had a band and they asked me to join. But they had a keyboard player. And I thought, no, that kind of sucks, <laughs> you know. And, but then they said, we need a drummer. And I said, you know what? I have a friend who has a drum kit I've never played drums, but I'm sure I can handle. So I, I borrowed a drum kit and we did some gigs. And I mean, back in the 60s, it was nothing else but as long as you could hold the beat, you were in the game, you know. So um, I became a drummer for, I'm not quite sure, maybe eight or ten shows. And then for still non, no, not known reasons, the keyboard player all of a sudden left. And I kind of raised my arm and said, I think I'm going to take this position now. I think I can do better there. And so that's how I became a keyboard player, um, keyboard player in a band. And then from then on, it, uh, we started doing the local scene. I mean, we were still talking late 60s. Um, any Beatles tune we did was like brand new on the charts, you know. Stones were brand new, Honky Tonk Woman and stuff like that. They only came out like in 68 or 69, you know. So uh, we had a lot of fun doing this. And, but it was strictly local level, strictly amateurish, so to speak. Little did I know I was going to make it my profession later on. But um, I, I had, a, had a ball doing this. I was like 16 and just about turning 17. And, but I... Um, I was still in school, high school, and my mom 
wanted to take me out and luckily she didn't take me out when I was like 14 and sent me to a conservatory to study viola. Not even violin, viola, but it, it's basically the same, just a little lower, you know. And I had a long talk with my mom and I said, Mom, I, I, I don't think I'm, I don't think this is my calling in life. I think I rather want to finish high school and then I want to go to university and until I get some sort of sign or I feel some sort of sign, this, this is what I need to do with my musical abilities. And I'm glad I did this. My mom, actually, I was very thankful to her. Uh, she said, okay, uh, if you feel so strong about it, then do it. So I finished high school. I enrolled in, enrolled in university and I studied uh, five and a half years to become music teacher for high school. Uh, because I thought um, th this was probably the, the broadest experience I could gather in a relatively short time. Because you had to play piano anyway, I had to play violin or viola either way. You always have to play two instruments. You learned the theory, you learned how to score, you learned how to read music perfectly, even if you read four stuffs with all different keys. Like a, or the clefs, I mean, uh, treble clef, alto clef, tenor clef, and bass clef. And you had to go through exercises where, where you literally had to sight read this. You know, and um, I think my mind got, got pretty sharp there because I got an A plus, I remember that. <laughs> it was one of my first um, real success, successes in, in high school. And um, so I, I, uh, I did not quite finish uh, university for one reason only. I had an offer, I was about 24 at that time. I had an offer from an English rock band who I just saw playing on the circuit in my, in my hometown of uh, Solingen, Germany. I don't think I mentioned this before, right? Uh, Solingen, Germany, near Cologne. Um, Solingen is actually well known because of their cutlery. You may have uh, knives of Solingen in your kitchen door. Anyway, um, uh, I, got a, I, I saw another band, an English professional English rock band at a county fair and a friend of mine took me there and said, I think you should check out this band. They have a really good guitar player and a not so good keyboard player. And obviously I got intrigued, so we went there and I had the same opinion about the band. And I thought, guitar player is great, really rocky, keyboard player, hmm, not so much. <laughs> so we ended up talking and it ended with me joining the band about three months later. And so this became my very first professional band. It was, uh, the band was called Twig. So there I was, all of a sudden a professional musician, moving out of the house, of my parents' house for that matter, and uh, go on the road. And it was actually a very, very cool um, experience and the only thing I, I wasn't so sure of the, was the housing we had to deal with those days. Um, no fancy hotels. It was literally like one room and all six of us had to sleep in there. I was like, oh gosh, is that the right decision I, make, I made? But we made it through it anyway. And about eight months later, we went ahead and did something which was kind of unheard of. Uh, we all looked for apartments our own little apartments right in the middle of Germany so we could go from our house or our apartments um, to either, any place in Germany within three hours or something you know yeah so we did this and um, it got a lot better not not living in hotels or in shabby <laughs> places um, anyway so we had this band for two years and then um, it was the time of the um, late 70s where all these American bands came out like Journey, Kansas, Foreigner, Toto, all with these guys with the high vocals and the, the band except the singers really wanted to have a singer like that because we, we wanted to write good songs and that was fashion those days. I mean everybody, every band had this, this kind of uh, singer and we thought we should do the same thing. So eventually we got rid of our two singers and got ourselves a high P 
high-pitched singer, uh, American guy. American guy. He uh, lived just around the corner from us. He was actually a dependent. Uh, that means his parents were in the military, but he wasn't. So he was not. Uh, uh, didn't have to work on base or anything like that. He was available, in other words. And we had a great time. We recorded an album with him back in 1981, which was coincidentally re-released in America in 2006 as a 25th anniversary CD by one of our big fans over there. I thought it was rather cool. The band name, band's name was Breakpoint. And so we did like um, three years all together. Then we had, a, we had this American singer and he got in trouble with the law. Uh, in Europe, he, he just transported drugs from Holland into Germany, something I told him he shouldn't do, but he did anyway. And of course he got caught and then he got um, thrown out of the country, basically, you know. And I wasn't very happy about that at all. All of a sudden we had this great band with a great singer and we couldn't use him anymore, you know. But as life happens all the time, you, you find somebody else, you know, and ultimately the second guy turned out to be the better one. Not necessarily because of the high range voice, but his whole personality fits so much better to us. And we all kind of started making a decision or coming, coming up with a decision to eventually move to America. Because our band was very American. I was the only German in the band and um, the, the drummer was half German, half English, everybody else was British. Uh, the first singer was American, but the second singer was British as well. So either way, I was the only non-regular English-speaking guy. And since it was my band, I ultimately went over to America several times, tried to find a place for us to play, tried to find an agency who can book us, tried to find a, hopefully get a record recording contract over here over, or over there. Now it's over here since we're in America. Anyway, long story short, um, it didn't work out. Uh, I ended up going by myself in 1986. And I said to everybody, I just want to go and explore America and see what it has to offer. And I'd rather do that and fail than sitting in Germany for the next 20 years and just thinking I should have gone and tried it. And everybody understood, and, and that was really nice of them, and we're still good friends to the day. So I came over to America, uh, Southern California. Los Angeles was still happening those days in the mid-80s. And I hooked up immediately, uh, literally within three weeks, with Tim Bogart from Vanilla Fudge, the bass player. And he took me under his wings, and he always said, Martin, my German friend, come, let's play. Let's play music together. And that was really cool. And uh, we, in 1987, at the NAMM show, the biggest music fair in the world, NAMM show in Anaheim, uh, we were the headliner with, this, with that specific band. And all of a sudden, before you knew it, we had Eddie Van Halen on stage, we had Steve Stevens from Billy Idol on stage, John Anvisel uh, from The Who on bass, Chet, Chet McCracken from the Doobie Brothers on the drums, and me on the keyboards. And I was just standing there, I remember, this is exactly why I came to America. Yes, very cool. And then one thing led to another. Um, be, I mean, out of pure coincidence, I went to the musician's contact service and found um, a position, open position as a keyboard player for Lita Ford. I didn't have no idea who she was, to be honest. And I just picked up a tape and was scheduled three days later to come for an audition. And I put the tape in my car and I had to drive to the desert to play with the local band. And I thought, it sounds pretty good. Hmm, interesting. Little did I know it was the rough mix of what later turned out to be the CD of Lita Ford. So I went in for audition. I got the gig after two auditions. The first one was just uh, keyboards. The second one was for vocals. And as I mentioned before, I was not much of a singer and I thought, oh, here we go, here goes the, the job. But it didn't. For some reason, I passed the audition and then we uh, went on the road back in 1987. And we went on the road with Poison, <coughs> actually it was 88, Poison, Ted Nugent, Ingrid Malmsteen, 
Um, and then we got the big one being an opening act for Bon Jovi. And if you recall, in 1988, 89, they were the biggest band in the world. And we toured like three months, three months all over Europe. And it was really cool, but uh, we weren't on a retainer, so when we came back and we didn't tour, there was no money. So I was, you know, thinking, okay, if, if, if I get any other offer, and it's a good offer, I'll take that. Funny enough, I got a call from Meatloaf, and uh, some of his, his band members had seen me performing at the Beacon Theater in New York with Lita Ford. And when it came time for Meatloaf to need another, to have to need another keyboard player, the, his, his, the guys in his band remembered me, and they said, "Give that guy a call," you know. And so we got together and we played together, and it was wonderful. We went to very obscure places like the Middle East, all these places you rather don't want to visit right now, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, but it was a lot of fun time too, and. I stuck with him for about eight months, nine months. We uh, did, like like I said, the tour of the Middle East. We played Iceland. We played American college towns. We did another European tour. Um, and at one point, I kind of felt it wasn't really the right thing for me. Uh, I can't tell you quite sure or, or exactly why, but you know, sometimes you have that feeling, mm, it's okay, but it's not exactly what I'm looking for. And so we, we split, and that's fine, uh, amicably. And I joined uh, for about three years a local band. But the cool thing about that local band in Los Angeles, we did a lot of in, a lot of original stuff as well. So, because I, I, I always wanted to start writing songs, and or, I or, or already wrote a bunch of songs with Breakpoint, but I wanted wanted to keep doing this, right? So we had a chance to do this. And I jammed with a bunch of other bands simultaneously while I was in Southern California and got to know Walter Trout. And he's a, a fantastic blues player, blues rock player, kind of like Stevie Ray Vaughan. And he just came, uh, he used to be with John Mayer and the Blues Breakers. And a lot of great guitar players went through that school. You know, like um, Jeff Beck and Eric Clapton and Jimmy Page, they were all at times with John Mayer, right? Um, anyway, so I ended up playing with him and, and we had a great time. We toured the world, literally like four continents and uh, tons of countries. Not so much in America. I mean, every, he was really well known everywhere else, but not in the US. Very strange thing. And I have quit Walter after five years, though we had a fabulous time. But I, I was driven. Uh, I just wanted to have my own band and wanted to finally start my own project. I felt like it was great to play with all these bands, going on world tours and everything is fine. But my initial idea, of the, the, the reason why I moved over to America is to be Martin, you know, to write my own music and hopefully become big with that, with this one. So I, I Walter and me split again amicably uh, the end of 97 after five years to being together. And I wanted to start my own band right there. And I got a call from Eric Burden. And I was looking at my wife at that time and I thought, what am I supposed to do now? I really was wanted to do my own thing and now I get this offer. I mean, it's Eric Burden and the Animals. Oh my God, you know. Well, we decided I should do this for a while. And, um, and it was the right decision because uh, a lot of people in the world got to know me as well. And we played everywhere. I mean, it was just incredible. We were gone like 240 days a year, which ultimately led to the demise of my first marriage, too. <laughs> yeah, some people can't take it, you know, but it's okay. I found a beautiful second wife, so... Second, second's always better than first, in my opinion. Anyway, so with Eric Byrne, I was for uh, about eight years, and um, he, overnight, at one point, called us or literally made us quit the band because he, uh, his girlfriend at that point pretty much told him, look, you know, I don't want you to have this band anymore. It's politics, whatever, you know. And uh, so he called us um, and pretty much disbanded the band right there. Weirdly enough, though, um, about maybe five years earlier, 
I had gotten to know the bass player for Iron Butterfly. He lived about a, a, a mile and a half down the street from me, down in Southern California. And I did local appearance, appearances every now and then. And he showed up and um, we jammed in a Gaza da Vida. Incidentally, I've jammed this song with each and every band in my life without knowing ultimately I would end up in the band. And they were my childhood heroes. When that record came out, I was just mesmerized back in 68. Anyway, um, so he constantly told me, Martin, come on, join us. We, we want you, we need you. I said, Lee, I'm with the animals. I can't do both. And with you guys, I would be frontman and lead singer. I can't do that simultaneously. Hang in there a little bit. I, I, something will happen. And funny enough, it did happen. We got canned from Eric Burden, you know, and so I called Lee and overnight I was an Iron Butterfly. No audition, nothing. It's just, okay, you got the job. And it was just wonderful. And if you ever want to realize your dreams and be there where you always wanted to be, that was right there the moment where it's like, yes, I can, and I'm playing with my childhood heroes. What I didn't forget though, what I was mentioning before, I still wanted to do my own thing as well. I, ha I had started my own band during the uh, later, the, the last Eric Burden years already, and toured Europe with my band, and put out CD, a video. So my project is started in 2003. With the, I played with the Animals till 2005, and then immediately joined Iron Butterfly, and still maintaining my own band, and still uh, going on tour in Europe, for some reason, never really America, other than every now and then we did gigs in Southern California. Had probably to do with the fact that the band was made out of four Germans, but two of us lived in Los Angeles, which was interesting too. And, uh, and I, I just thought I have to pull this thing through, and I figured Iron Butterfly is not as busy or not as old, they are actually older than the Eric Burden band was, so I, I assumed they wouldn't tour as much. And I was right, I was right. We only toured like way less than Eric Burden. I mean, like I said, Eric Burden, we were gone for 240 days a year with Iron Butterfly, maybe 60. So I had a heck of a lot of time uh, left to, to uh, play with my own band and write songs and follow my own project. And uh, in 2009, I disbanded my own band and it became a little bit too expensive because I always threw them over to Europe and, and we were on the verge of making it but we were not quite over the hump, you know. And uh, then a couple of my band members, though they're good friends there, at one point they said, we, we kind of like to play a little harder music, you know, and I said, you know, then you gotta go on Look, look for another band because I write the music I write and the, the band carries my name here Martin Grishers and Friends uh, and I pretty much want to decide what kind of music we play because it's all my music right? so again we split amicably this seems to be a tenor in my life here the common thread that basically I split split amicably with everybody even with Eric Byrne it was he and I did never had a problem you know um, anyway, so since 2009, simultaneously with, to I Am Butterfly, I ran my solo show and it became bigger and bigger now too. And I, I play in Europe and I play in 2013, I came, went up to Oregon for the first time um, because I had hooked up with another side project called Romancing the West and they're based out of Oregon. And be, whenever I flew up to Oregon to play a couple of shows with them, I found myself a few other gigs who I could play and therefore introduced my music to Oregonians. And in the meantime, I'm doing a lot of shows in Oregon. I do a whole bunch in Washington State. I play a lot in Northern California on the way up there when I come from Southern California. Last year I did a few shows in Illinois, in Indiana. This year I'm supposed to, uh, in, I mean, I'm doing Oregon as we speak. Um, next. A couple of weeks from now, I'll be in Europe for five weeks, which would be May, June of 2016. Then in July, I'll be in Oregon, Washington State again. And August, we're talking about East Coast, a few festivals back there. And September, we're actually talking about Peru. 
Peru is simply, for one reason, I recorded with a Peruvian band and it became kind of a minor hit in Peru, that specific song. And now they said, you gotta come down and play it with us live. You know, it's like, okay, why don't you fly me down there and then we take things from there. So now we are in negotiations to do this in uh, September of this year, 2017. 16. For all of these years, you have been working with all kinds of wonder, wonderful musicians, some big bands, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, uh, the Animals, uh, Iron Butterfly, and, uh, and you've traveled all over the United States and all over Europe. All over the world. All over the world, yep. right. I've done actually four continents, 37 countries, and 49 American states. Well, you must have a lot of flyers miles. Yes, I had about a million at one point. <laughs> well, uh, you did. You did mention that you lost your your first wife, uh, perhaps because of all that all that travel. Yeah, there may be may have been other reasons involved, but officially, she said, "I can't take this." Well, like you've been gone 240 days a year, and I couldn't. I mean, I kind of understood it. Um, and maybe there were other reasons involved, but again, it was an amicable split, other than the fact that she got 50% of my money, that's law. <laughs> now, yeah, well, what are you gonna do? What, uh, what was it like to play on a big stage uh, with, a, with a known band where fans are just on their feet, screaming at you like you're a god? <laughs> uh, very good question. Um, it makes you feel really good at first, then after a while it kind of becomes habit, you know, you kind of expect it, and then after another while you realize ultimately all the ador adoration or the applause mainly goes to the main guy of the band. In a way we were just a band, though I have to say a lot of Fans treated us very well too and liked us a lot, but Eric was the main thing in the animals, you know. It was different with Iron Butterfly because I, I became the front man because I was lead singer, right? And um, though the bass player, he was the original guy, so was the drummer. Uh, he sang one and a half songs and the guitar player sang one song, but I sang all the other ones. So that made me automatically uh, uh, more uh, a person people were drawn to. So, so that, would, that felt good. So, yeah, so how did that feel when you were the star? I still wasn't the star, I was the lead singer. The star was still, were the two original guys. But I was right there with them. You know, I was not just a keyboard player, no, I was the lead singer as well. And I had the, uh, the duty, but I liked to doing this anyway, uh, to talk to the audience and get him involved and you know stuff like that. Getting that much love, do you do you begin to have maybe a false view of who you are? Uh, do you get to a place where you think, uh, "Wow, well, maybe I am this amazing person, <laughs> and everyone should love me." Don't musicians think that? <laughs> All the musicians in the world? I'm amazing. Um, you know, I, I was hoping that, you know, but I never took it for granted. And being part of a band, you, you can always blame it on the band, ultimately. You don't really uh, realize they may actually like me. But when you're a solo act, ever since I'm doing that, there is nobody else on stage. So I take the liberty of saying they like me. You know, and that makes me feel really good today because uh, I'm, I've always, all my life, I've given it 120% with whatever I do and finally I'm getting recognized for this too. We write this song, nothing will go wrong, no, no, no. We write this song, nothing will go wrong. Let's talk a moment about 
the opposite side. When you're on stage, there's all that adoration and love. But what is it like in the quietness of a hotel, and some of them dingy hotels, some of them perhaps very, very nice, but you're alone? Well, I'm alone in my room, but I usually go to the bar and socialize with people, and very many times people from the concert show up there because they reckon you're probably in the bar, and you strike really good conversations, and it's not that star audience or audience situation anymore. It becomes more like, we're drinking a beer together, we're just having fun, we're just talking about God and life and whatever, you know. Not necessarily just music. And I like these moments too. And that's where I'm, I made a lot of friends over those situations, you know, in a, in a hotel bar, just talking and then they remember me later on and vice versa. When you, when you were speaking to these people who were not musicians themselves, did you get the feeling that they were in awe or after a moment or two, did, did you get the feeling that they were accepting you just as another person? Both. It, it, it certainly starts off that they're, wow, you're actually talking to us? And then it, 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 it gives way within like 30 seconds that I'm just a musician. I'm a normal guy like you. You know, we're just two normal guys sitting in a bar and having a good time, you know, talking about world problems or whatever, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, it became, like I said, it became uh, not this fanship, but a, more like a relationship between this person or these persons and me. And I cherish them to the, to the day. I have lots of friends w w w w with whom our friendship, or with them, no, I mean, our friendship started just like, just there in hotel rooms, you know, hotel bars, I mean, sorry. What's the most important thing for you right now in your life? What would your answer to me be? I, I sound like a supermodel now. I'd like world peace. But that's, it's, it has never been more, I mean, that's probably wrong too, because there always have been wars. There always have been... Uh, crashes be or clashes between people, between nations. But right now it's just getting out of control. Um, all these terror, terror organizations, they start ruling the world and this can't be, right? I, I think it's, um, it would be a good time for the rest of the human beings in the world to get together and maybe forget about all the little quarrels they have and get together and, and stand up against the, t the terror groups and hopefully get this world back on track. That would be a nice thing. Do you think you can contribute in some way to that, that world peace that you are, think, are hoping for? Or is that, is that too idealistic? It's probably too idealistic, but I can do whatever, whatever I can do. And how much it will be in the end remains to be seen. But I certainly don't give up on it, let's put it this way. But uh, it's a huge world, there's huge problems, it takes a huge effort from mankind to get together and work this out. I do my little share, hopefully somebody else jumps, uh, jumps uh, on the wagon here and uh, does it as well. Maybe all together we can do something, you know. That's, I just, I just like peace and, um, understanding and people should enjoy music and should enjoy each other. I grew up in a nice household, you know, so I, we, of course we had problems, every family has problems. Um, but I have terrific siblings, my parents are both dead, but uh, terrific siblings, we all get along, we love each other and we all have huge circle of friends and it's, it's beautiful and I wish the whole world could be like this. And again, I sound like a supermodel. <laughs> actually, I was thinking you're, you're sounding like a John Lennon tune. Well, it's actually funny. Um, I always end my shows with um, Imagine. Imagine. Yeah, that's as a must. I mean, I always say at the very end, even if people don't clap anymore for some reason, I'm not done yet because this is my final message. You know, John, John Lennon gave us the message in 1970. It's still as current as it was then. Absolutely. And it will probably never stop being current. For you personally, what's a lifestyle like? Those days or now? Well, you can talk about both. Okay. Um, of course, it, it gets handed to you on a silver platter. 
basically when you're in a big band, especially 70s, 80s, into the early 90s. And um, I certainly um, was one of the guys who probably abused everything, for that matter. Let it be, <laughs> let it be the sexual thing, let it be the drugs. Um, but I'm probably I'm one of the lucky guys who found an end to it as well and, uh, you know, realized what life is really all about. It's about music and not about being adored and not about being uh, screwed up and, and the F word fucked up all the time and drunk and all that. It's just no point, you know. We all went, everybody went through this and, and some people got out of it, some people just couldn't get out of it. I don't, still don't know why not because um, I always think whatever you get yourself into, you usually should be able to get yourself out, out of that as well, <laughs> if nothing else, with other, other people's help. But let it be the way it is, you know, it's like I, I got out of it, um, certainly with help of my second wife as well. She was very instrumental and I'm happy she enforced it. I'm happy I stuck with it because finally over the last 10 years now I can concentrate on Martin and finally put my music out there and hopefully give other people hope as well. It is possible, you know, even at my age, it is possible to still do as more or less successfully at this point um, what you want to do, what you always wanted to do. That actually, um, one of my songs is called You're Never Too Old to do what you like as long as you like what you do. And that is probably the best message I, get, I can give people. You know, just, I, I just talked to these guys, friends of mine, like two days ago, and they were they're 64 and 65, and they said, we always wanted to start our own company, and we're always scared. I said, why? It, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And I literally sang this song for them. And it was so uplifting for them that they said, you know, Martin, I think we're going we're gonna to go for it. I said, yes. You never told to do what you like as long as you like what you do. You never told to play the game as long as you play. Freaking out, I just turned 60. Is this the end of the road? Could it be all that life has to offer? Is this what it means to be old? But I say, you never told to do what you like as long as you like. thought what's really going on or are you just giving up it's all up to you cause you are in charge only you can get back to the top that's why I say you never told to do what you like as long as you like what you do never told to play the game as long as you play by the rules
as long as you like what you do. You never told to play the game as long as you play by the rules. As long as you play, as long as you play by the rules, you never to old. Imagine that you had a, a full and rich life. Uh, you died when you were 95, mm -hmm. and miraculously, your closest friends, family members and friends, they're still alive. <laughs> and they're having a memorial service to commemorate your life. What would you like them to say about you? I wish he had paid us the debts back. No, <laughs> just kidding. Um, I, I'd like them just to talk about me as the person as, as I was, that I was. Just... Um, not as a rock star or whatever you want to call it. No, just um, a guy you could talk to, you could have fun with, you could sit down, have a beer with, uh, who care, generally cares about people. I got that trait from my mom, actually. Um, I, I think she keeps living in me. I, every day I find out I have another trait of my mom. And it comes out. And basically, I respect everybody. I do not disrespect somebody because of, let's say, race, age, uh, different tastes, anything, you know. I, I talk to everybody and make them feel as welcome as possible. And uh, so as soon as or as long as my friends and my family remember that, that would be nice if they said that about me. I don't need anything else of the, of the uh, rock and roll life, you know. That's, I'm just a normal human being like you and I. If you could capture in one sentence uh, a phrase that you'd like on your tombstone that uh, uh, captured the life of, of mm -hmm. Martin Gershwitz, mm -hmm. what would it be? You never, you, ne you never know unless you try. Story of my life. Mm -hmm.